Do you get your water? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I have matches. I always carry matches. I can't say that I've ever seen people go out, but I've never seen anybody. So. We're going to start. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone. We're uh, happy to have you here for this wonderful program tonight, put on by our one of our own members. I think it's pretty cool. I'm Linda Albee, Vice President of the League in Manistee County, and um, our wonderful chief, Nancy, is out in Arizona. Poor girl. Yeah. <laughs> Basking in the sun. Mm -hmm. Glad that you're all here on this lovely Valentine's Day, and I hope that you're all having a wonderful Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Um, just uh, want a couple of little announcements that I wanted to make. Uh, number one, I want to do, um, let you know that we're going to celebrate the 99th anniversary of the League of Women Voters tonight with a little cake, which is kind of neat. But however, it's actually the 100th anniversary in April of the League of Women Voters in Michigan. It, um, in Michigan, on September, uh, April the 4th, 1919, the 33rd Convention of the Michigan Eight Equal Suffrage Association was held in Grand Rapids and the members voted to become the Michigan League of Women Voters, an organization for women only. Because the previous November, Michigan was the, one of the early states to ratify the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. So we're actually coming up on having the League of Women Voters in Michigan 100 years in April. And the following um, there were three states, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan. They, they were the first three states to ratify the 19th Amendment, which is pretty cool. And um, the organization, we preceded the one that was done nationally, but then we kind of joined with them and everything was all done in one thing. But I thought that was kind of cool to know that we were kind of ahead and how progressive Michigan was at that time. I thought that was a neat, neat little piece of information. And really, the uh, original tenets and mission of the League is the same now as it was back 100 years ago, and that was to create an educated electorate. And that's still our main goal. We do lots of other things, but that's the main goal, and making sure that we um, are working to make sure the electorate understands about democracy and being part of it. February of 1920 was when the National League was officially started. So that anniversary will be then coming up. Um, in May, May, this May, the 17th through the 19th, the League of Women Voters of Michigan will hold its convention and they do that, is it, how do you say it, biannually when it's every two years? And, um, they will, at that time, they'll be kind of celebrating the fact that the, there's been a league here since uh, for 100 years. So I think that's kind of a cool thing to know. And if anyone is interested in going to the convention, it will be held in Livonia, Michigan. There's lots of people, when we go, most people get together and ride together and it works really well. But if you really want to know what the league is about on a larger scale, going to that convention is the way to have it work, because it really gives you the knowledge about what they're doing, what the, um, what the real focus of the League is, and how they're proceeding. And I think you all know the League is a grassroots organization, all nonpartisan. We never support or, or um, propose any kind of um, political party or any candidate. We don't do any of that. But we do take policy positions on different issues of interest to our communities and our larger world. And so those are the things that we fight for. And you always wonder, well, what do my dues go for? What do all the money that I pay out go for? Well, it goes to our national and state 
league people that end up uh, having, a lot of times they have to have legal counsel, but they, pre they present themselves before committees of the legislature and they um, <clears throat> talk about the issues that the league cares about. And if you want to know more about the positions the league takes on a state level and or national, I would urge you to go to our websites and then you can find out what are, what's our position in education, what's our position on environment, etc. And it will give you a good reading of where we stand. And those positions every so often are reviewed and are they still up to date and are we still uh, what, what they should be. We still look at those and this spring the league, Fantasy League and all the leagues in Michigan there will be looking at our positions and reviewing them and looking at them and reading them and letting the state league know should we review any of these positions, should we update them, should we do anything. So we're always, remember it's a grassroots organization and everything comes from the membership. And so yeah, if you have ideas and things you think we should be promoting and looking at, you know, make your voice heard it would be a good thing. A um, couple of dates to keep in mind. <clears throat> um, the next meeting is conti we're continuing our study on water and we have a professor from Michigan State University who will present the geology of Michigan water. And this whole topic of water study is a fascinating one because I always think water is a ubiquitous thing. We just we don't even think about it. It's there and we're always it's always gonna be there. Well, not always, unless we take care of the land and take care of the water, it might be a problem. So Think about March 14th, that is when we'll have that professor come from the Uni Michigan State University and talk about the geology of water, which I think will be very fascinating. Um, and then we have another meeting in April, and I think that's on the 11th, Sandy? April 11th? Um, that date is yet to be determined. Okay, there'll be another meeting and in April. And it works out for the tribe. And that topic will again be focusing on another aspect of water. And so we, we started out in November talking about the Great Lakes and you know working down to our, our local water systems, our watershed and why it's important. So, you know, it's a, it's such a broad, important topic and I'm, I'm happy that we decided to look at it uh, in a more, uh, with, under the microscope. Please keep in mind on Thursday, April 25th, we'll have our fourth annual high school registration day at the Vogue Theater. And if you want to know more about it, I can enlighten you, one of the other members here can enlighten you, but it's a, a wonderful, wonderful project to help young people understand the importance of voting and um, getting them registered to vote. And kind of making it a, a, a passage into adulthood, which I think is an important element if you want uh, to have an educated electorate at, that at the uh, ballot box. On Friday, April 26th, we've got our annual, ninth annual fundraiser, Pictionary Olympics. And if you, um, you've ever played Pictionary at home, you know how much fun it can be. It's even more fun to play in a group setting. And uh, I'm going to let you know all about that as time goes on. And I would ask you that um, if you know of any business or group that might like to um, participate, or you like to encourage them to, you can take them one of these sheets. This is an application and a little bit about it. And so please, we can pass those around. You can take one of those. Um, also, I wanted to make sure, is everybody that's a league member getting the local newsletter? If you're not getting it, let me know. I'll make sure that I've got your right um, email. The other thing that you should be getting from the state league is a thing called the league links and it tells you everything that's happening on the state level. What's going on with the redistricting, what's happening with the census situation, etc. All of those things are in this information. So you should get that. And if you're not getting it, let, let me know and we'll make sure that you do. Okay. Um, now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to let you know we are having our wonderful member, Mary Reed, and her cohort in crime, Emily Cook. And Emily is from the, I want to make sure I get it right. Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. Okay. You can say I have some. Okay. And I will let them proceed when they have a fun program set for us. 
Okay, I guess we'll start. And um, uh, this is going to be kind of in three parts. I'm going to go over the watershed, some of the watershed things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Emily, and she's going to discuss how the invasive species affect our watershed. And then we're going to play a little Jeopardy. Now, some of the Jeopardy questions are real easy. Some of them I don't really expect that you will know the answer, but it gives us a teaching moment. So if we, things that we might have covered in the watershed presentation will perhaps be picked up when we're playing Jeopardy. So that's our plan. And so um, I'm going to start uh, with... Uh, I guess we should both introduce ourselves right at this point. So go ahead, Emily. <laughs> I'm going to be jumping in after Mary's talk, but um, so I don't do it later. My name is Emily Cook. I'm the Outreach Specialist with the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, and I'll talk a bit more about what that even is when I um, chat more. Um, but we're based out of Traverse City, and we work with primarily terrestrial invasive species, so in, uh, invasive plants. And um, it's going to be a little bit different from Mary's presentation. She's going to be focusing on the, you know, mentioning some of the aquatic invasive species, but actually the, the terrestrial side is, has, can have quite a big impact within the watershed as well. So I'll be talking about that. A little about me personally, um, I received my bachelor's degree in natural resources management from Grand Valley State in 2010. Um, kind of worked all over the place in the state and the country doing various invasive species jobs and education jobs, which brought me back to Michigan, my home state, in 2015. Um, and that's when I started with ISN in the outreach specialist position. It's, it's been a joy to have Emily here uh, and be a terrific <coughs> resource for us. Well, I went to U of M. Um, and then I also went to Aquinas and to Wayne. Uh, I was a pharmacist. I have a large family, uh, very large family, eight children, 22 grandchildren, and 18 great grandchildren. So um, we're quite busy with family uh, things. Uh, but I thought that I would start with a story, and that is how I happened to get up here and how I happened to get into the watershed. And this was 11 years ago, in 2008. Um, I was in the garden club, and uh, there were four of us, and we decided we didn't need a speaker for the next meeting. We would do the program, and we would each take two invasive species and discuss it with uh, the members of the garden club. So out of the blue, I took Phragmites, Spelled it with an F, I didn't even know what it was, and Eurasian water milfoil. And as I was giving my presentation, looked out the far center, the windows, to the lake, but you couldn't see the lake because the Phragmites was up to here, and we had been using it for our beautiful garden decorations. So uh, it was an eye opening experience to see that what I was talking about was really. Uh, uh, an issue for us here in uh, in Onekama and on Portage Lake. So when we got done, I thought, well, what should I do about this? So I thought, well, I'll just go to the watershed. I had no idea that the watershed had just was just formed. They were just in 2008 received their state and federal um, uh, 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 certification. And so um, I went to them and they said, they had a, a subcommittee on environmental affairs and they said, why don't you work with this committee and uh, do some research and see what would be the best practice and come back. So we did that. Um, in fact, that was 11 years ago and that committee is still working on uh, the same project. So. Um, they didn't have any money. And when we went through what things others were doing, we called at least 20 different lakes and the DNR and the DEQ to see you know, where we might be able to get some money. Mm -hmm. And that was the problem with all the lakes that we talked to. And so uh, a special assessment district was, was recommended. And so uh, 
the watershed said, oh, well, you have to go to the township. So we went to the township, and our township was very positive. And we did an amazing job to get through a special assessment district by um, August of 2009. We did our first treatment. And we were first looking at um, just the Phragmites. And really that helped us in the long run because we, when we decided to survey the lake for the Phragmites, and we had 84 acres, um, we said, oh, probably we should check and see what's happening in the lake. And that was our big eye-opening surprise, that we had 164 acres of a region water meltwater. And that has been our challenge since we started. Um, actually, we're a poster child on the Phragmites. We did a presentation with the Stewardship Network um, on uh, successes from the field. And we did it with uh, Oakland and Beaver Island. And so it was, we've done, we've done well with our Phragmites, but the original water field flow is still, a, <laughs> is still a, an ongoing issue for us. So, that's how I got here anyway. So, I joined the watershed and um, have served as chair. And Kathy Irvin, who is here tonight, is one of the founding members of the watershed. Uh, it took them a couple of years before they, uh, <laughs> before they were able to develop their plan and submit the plan. Uh, right now, it is uh, 10 years since the plan has been approved, and we have um, gone down the road to get our plan updated. And so starting in, I think we started in 2017, and two years, and we finally submitted it in December to the DEQ, and it will take them two or three months before we get it back. I do have a draft. Here, in case anybody's interested. And I brought our old plan. Um, the state, we do not have to update and, um, our, the plan for the state certification, but for the EPA, uh, to keep that certification, you have to update it every 10 years. <laughs> Getting shaky. <laughs> so, that's why I'm here, and now I'm going to go ahead with a brief deal on, on the watershed. And we do have some folders here. Actually, they are very well done. Boy, the person that did them is also sitting here. But in this folder, it goes through what is a watershed, um, what about the Portage Lake watershed, what can you do, and what is a watershed plan. So I'm kind of going to follow that same format, starting out with what is a watershed. And I, I think, you know, it's hard to tell, but I think most of you and everyone knows that a watershed is, a, is the, the uh, area of land where all of the water drains to one point. And in our watershed, it all drains <coughs> to uh, Portage Lake. And the whole United States has 21 watersheds. Uh, the USGA did all of the surveying, and so there's 21 big watersheds, which are broken down into four different categories, you know, getting smaller. So, for instance, the Portage Lake watershed is part of the Great Lakes watershed, which is part of the, then it goes down to Lake Michigan, then it goes to the eastern side of Lake Michigan, and then it goes to the Betsy Platte. And then, and then into Portage Lake. So Portage Lake is really uh, a part of the Betsy Platt watershed. Mm -hmm. And each of the watersheds has a number, uh, the hydrology uh, unit code, and the HUC number. And it's 8, 10, or 12. And as they get smaller, the number gets bigger. So we're a 12 number, a 12 digit number uh, for our watershed. And so, this is exactly what we talked about, that the boundaries are based on the topographical boundaries, separated by points of land and high elevations. So what you're doing up in the hills 
is the impact that comes down into our lake. So we have had instances of perhaps paint being dumped into the ground, as they used to do. I know my dad and did things like that, but it will go all the way down, and we have pictures of it going all the way down to our lake. And there's our lake, calm, beautiful. And so when he was talking about the different classes and how they're divided, we have a total of 264 watersheds in the United States. And I have the state one here that can show the watersheds in Michigan, but I, I didn't have the, the great big one of the United States. And so the next thing is the watershed plan. Um, you know what a watershed is, but the next step was to develop a plan of how we were going to protect um, and preserve it for the future. And so with our update that we're doing right now, we sent out surveys, because this is a community event. It isn't a uh, you know, few people in a room uh, doing it. It needs to be the whole community. And that's another one of the reasons why it was a good idea for us to update the plan. There was a lot of enthusiasm in 2008 around the watershed, but um, that, that dwindles. And so getting uh, everyone involved and steering committees uh, to look at everything. You know, we look at the lakes, the streams, the wetlands, the trees, the septics, everything that is involved in this watershed. Um, ooh, we look at rain gardens and of course water. That is what we're looking at. The groundwater, the storm, storm water, people, the contaminants. And it's changed in 10 years. Uh, what we looked at as contaminants 10 years ago is nothing like it is today with um, we have the Flint issue and the PFAS and new things that we need to be aware of. So our watershed plan that's right there has six goals, 25 objectives, and 70 tasks. Um, it took us a long time to pull all this information together and I think that we will have a lot of work to do after it's reviewed this first time. Um, but we will do that and we will edit it and we'll send it back to the DEQ. And we had five goals before, public health, aquatics, uh, the water-based recreation, but we, we pulled out of all of these goals the information and education because actually that's a lot of what we do is the information and education. So some of our projects were um, to me, we started out with the Phragmites and the Eurasian Water Mill Flow, and actually the watershed has been active in that project since 2008, actually. And with that, we increased our water quality monitoring. So I would almost state that we have more water quality monitoring for Portage Lake than any lake. Um, we were so afraid of doing anything that would hurt our lake with the treatment that we went, we have, well, I even brought uh, some of the books. We have an annual lake management report of everything that we do in the lake every year that we review with a lake manager. We um, survey, we treat, we survey again. Uh, we have 11 different water quality monitors. Um, we're, we're very sure that what we've done is, is what's the right thing for the lake. Um, we did a lot of research, and in fact, we did a three-year research project on the products we were using to make sure that we were using the most effective product with the right concentration the smallest concentration that we needed, and the hybrid that we have. We have hybrid Eurasian water milk milk that is harder to treat than, than the regular. 
But we've been busy with a lot of other things. We purchased wetlands at the east end of the lake and gave them to the uh, township to preserve it. Um, we put on programs like Tuesdays with Water and Water Wise. We've worked on sustainability with the foundation and have um, the, uh, an endowment fund set up and an annual fund to um, help us as we go on forward. Uh, we have a website and Facebook. We have received a SAW grant, which is a stormwater uh, asset management waste. I think that's the last. That's how they get the SAW. But it was a $221,000 grant, and it's three years of doing an assessment of our stormwater and groundwater. And so we're, we, the first year, we did, it, we did a lot of the paperwork, but this year we're, we have met and are going to be doing a lot more surveying. We uh, have Spicer, is, um, who we're working with. They helped us when we wrote the grant. So we've had a couple good meetings here in June. Well, in January to get started on that. Gary, can I, can I interrupt? Yeah. Do you, you want to take questions now or you want to wait? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm really ignorant about this, but what, what, what effect do fragmites have in the EMW? I don't have any understanding of what that is and why okay. it's dangerous for the watershed. The, the fragmites, you know, is, is, has roots that go out 40 feet and it's very dense and it crowds out all your native plants. So if you don't have your native plants and your native habitat, they can't even get through these weeds that are so tall. Um, what danger is it to the watershed? Well, to the watershed, the whole watershed is with the plants and the uh, uh, animals and the bugs and the, the whole circle of life. Um, they disrupt everything. And it's the same thing in the water. Rearrange and water milfoil spreads with fragmentation. The boats, the boats bring it from one lake to another if they don't have the clean boats. Clean water is one of the big um, uh, things that everyone's working on. But again, they crowd out your native plants. They get so thick in the water that the fish can't get through. Um, does that answer your so you were saying basically it interrupts the health of the lake overall, if it's allowed to propagate. Yes, it does. Um, well, you have a whole bunch of weeds dying, and that can, as they are on the bottom of the lake, they disrupt the bottom of the lake and release their phosphorus and their, um, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. And then, and then the, are all the rivers considered watershed, the rivers in Michigan, because yes. of all the water runoff? Yes. So they're all considered watershed as well, right? Yes, or most not? of your watersheds do empty into a river, um, like where the Platte and Betsy River right. that, that they all drain into. And the Little Manistee is just now um, putting their watershed plan together and submitted that to the DEQ a couple weeks ago. Okay. Um, so they've done a lot of work of, of uh, working in their watershed and, and getting, uh, they have a lot of issues of, of what's happening along the, the river. Um, is the work, is the work mostly, watershed work mostly from private people, resources, or is it? Well, the watershed's stuff? partner. That's the whole um, key. We partner like with the township and then like when we we did the SAD, or we, we went to the township this summer and we said we are a little concerned about our E. coli testing around the lake. We do three or four different areas of the lake. We'd like to expand it to 10. And so we went with the health department around the lake and chose some different sites, but it was a township project. The township was the one that uh, expanded and did that project. We did Swimmer's Itch. Now we did, we paid for that ourselves. And we did a one month study on Swimmer's Itch in, in Portage Point a couple of years ago. And uh, two people uh, took samples for a month. 
uh, to determine if we had swimmers each and then in two different sections of the lake. And, and Portage Lake does not have a problem, but we're still on the steering committee for Swimmers Itch in Michigan. They've received a couple of large grants, 250,000, three times, three years, to do further studies on Swimmers Itch. And it's amazing, the studies that they are doing. But um, the, their feeling is you can't have pure Michigan and have people come up here and go swimming and uh, come out of the water with Swimmers Itch. And it is a huge issue on some of these lakes. And so they really want to see why we are, um, as we are in some of these other lakes, have the issue. You know, Crystal, Higgins, Lime Lake, Leelanau, um, there were five lakes that really got started with this uh, because they have a significant issue with it. But that's one thing we do. We don't, we don't do, except for education, um, usually do a project ourselves. Although we went ahead on our own to get raise the money to purchase the wetlands that came up for sale. Uh, we do with the um, Manistee Conservation District. We formed a partnership with them and um, a watershed partnership and they have been uh, another one of our partners that we work with. Uh, Northwest Invasive Species Network that is a, another um, partner that if we have an issue, it used to be that we had to put on the program and do the education. Now we have someone that we can call. Um, so that's, I think, a key to what watersheds do and how they, um, how they can accomplish things. The other thing is education. That is such an important part. Working with the kids, that's a, another one of our uh, goals. We did. We have had two. We had a high school student and we had a college student that uh, we uh, had as interns for um, years. But we would really like to see how we could get to the youth and to the uh, young people with this. Uh, uh, stream monitoring is another thing that, you know, we work with the, we volunteer with the uh, conservation district again to do stream monitoring. Um, we would even like to, as we go forward, be able to have them be the experts that would come and do some of our streams of concern. Um, but a lot of our work is done just a lot like what you do. We study an issue, we report on it, if we see that, the, that something needs to be done, we um, follow through, if, you know, um, but the, the list is very long of all the issues and the, the things in the watershed that you need to be aware of and watching for. Um, any other questions? Is the effect of uh, septic uh, tanks on most of the inland lakes in Michigan uh, major? Major, yes. There's 1.2 million septics here in Michigan, and a great deal of those are located around the lake. I mean, there's a place for, for septic systems, but not around the lake or close to uh, the water because of the water table. Yes. Isn't Michigan one of the very few states that allows uh, septics around uh, recreational lakes? I, I thought I heard that somewhere. Yes, Michigan is very poor as far as their septic um, issue, the whole septic cut. After they're, they're good with, before it goes in the ground with their rules and regulations. Once it's in the ground, we, we do not have a statewide septic system inspection regulation. So once you've put it in the ground, it, unless you sell your property, if you sell your property, Michigan does have the point of sale that they have to inspect the septic system at, uh, at the point of sale. Only some counties though. Not, not, that's not a no, state. No, it's not a state it's one. Not a state one. No. no, that's by counties too. Yes, and we have that here in Manistee. Um, but, right. Okay. <coughs> so, 
what do we do? You know, you ask, what do we do? Well, one thing is groundwater contamination and going into our lake. So rain gardens are one thing that are promoted as being um, effective with uh, filtering out the contaminants before they go to the lake. Uh, a rain garden is planted with native plants which have roots, you know, real, real long roots. And so um, they can filter out the contaminants before it goes to the lake. So at one point we said we would like to have 20 rain gardens around uh, in, our, in our watershed, which is still a good goal. But um, what we did was we worked with um, Rob Carson and we did a community rain garden and it, he, we measured the roof, we measured the parking lot, we put our drainage pipes in, and this is after a rain, just to show that the garden, in fact, is, everything is draining into the, to the rain garden. And so then we also did education on how to build a rain garden and um, encouraging people to, to build rain gardens. Uh, we do always report on the fish and the fishing and what's happening and making sure that fish are not being affected by what we're doing. This is just to show that we participate in community-wide things. And this again was a person that's sitting in this room, but it says we toil at keeping the watershed clean and flush with success. Um, so we have some kind of a watershed scarecrow for all the the days. Just a little watershed humor. It's just a little watershed humor. It doesn't <laughs> hurt to do that. We participate in the boat washing um, activities. There's two or three portable boat washings, washers that we schedule and, and have come to Onekama and then granddaughters uh, have to participate and volunteer. So it's a lot of fun. Um, the swimmer's itch study, that's just showing one of our volunteers. Oh, and like the stream monitoring and the macro and bird rights. Uh, I, I look for a picture of you, Jim. I know I have some in my pictures, but anyway, it's, a, it's the um, project of um, taking samples in the uh, streams and then according to the macro and bird roots or the bugs that you find, good bugs, um, make good streams, you know, the, the catalog, I think I brought, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> then after you collect all your bugs, then you catalog all the bugs and see, and that will help you determine how, how your, um, how, how clean your stream is. Uh, oh, and that's another person in the room who's, carefully studying something that she found in the stream. And then as you ask about the um, septics, here's all the septics going into the... And it's not to say that septics aren't, aren't fine in different places, but around a lake or a river, it is um, certainly... And I, there are some states that have outlawed them. And I think Minnesota, do you, do you happen to know that for sure? Yeah, I, uh, but we do not have that regulation here. And this is just, again, with education, that we set up displays and do education. And here's the many benefits of wetlands. And it was a 2.4 acre uh, lot that we purchased and then uh, deeded to the township as a preserve. And then I've gone with different people who are um, doing their stream studies on storm drains and um, this is just a picture of, of one of the storm drains that is uh, you know, in need of some uh, help. I put this in because we found this in the canal um, and in fact there were three or four of them and it is that size almost of a basketball and very concerning just we're sure that we really had a problem but actually, it isn't a problem. It, it's a bunch that come together and they filter the water. Um, it's I, we, looked, we found it. My husband had a, his underwater camera and took several pictures. But 
Um, anyone that often that finds anything in the lake or in the watershed will call us and we'll come and see if we can determine. So that's a good thing. It's a good thing, but it sure was scary because we thought, oh my gosh, what is that? And it, the fact that it wasn't just one, there were uh, three or four, but you can look it up and, and find all sorts of information on them, but it, it, it's not a, a bad thing. And then here's the Fragmites picture that we um, always use, and I think that she'll have the same picture. It's a classic. And then this is when we have volunteers after we treated our Fragmites. Um, then we did a cut and burn. Um, it, it worked. I mean, it really did work, but we had difficulties getting it in our piles and getting it burning, and we had to do it. Yes? I was just going to say you should, because we are a poster child for this, <laughs> you should uh, go back on the numbers as to how many acres of fragments we had before in the Rachel Water Mill for and how many we are treating or we treated this past year. Well, we had... If you can... Yes, I can. I can I pull that out. We had 84 before of Phragmites. 84 acres? 84 acres, yes, we did. And after our treatment, it came down to like maybe 20 or 30 acres, but now we have less than an acre. But we still uh, survey the whole lake because we have other things, we have yellow iris, we have purple loose strife, uh, we have a little bit of Japanese knotweed, but we do the whole survey of the lake, even though for the last four or five years it's been less than um, less than an acre of Phragmites. It's difficult to, to, you don't have a plot of it, you have a swipe here and a swipe there. Uh, we don't go in and just spray and spray, we swipe, especially now that it's in control like that. And our um, Eurasian water mill foil was 164 acres, and this year it was less than 50. Now we've had it as low as, le as 20, but it, it's, it's an up and down. It, it, it's not, um, uh, you know, it, you, you can't just say, oh gosh, now we got conquered, because the next year it could go back up to 100. But we, the downward trend is, is good with both of our treatments. Um, if you were to, if the watershed people <coughs> were not taking care of it, who would? Well, you could go and petition probably the township. Um, that's what some, uh, some places do that don't have an active um, watershed. The people around the lake would. It, it, when the Eurasian water, maybe I did do a Eurasian water mill. Oh, yeah, it, it will form a whole mat across the top of a, of a lake. Uh, Paradise Ooh. Lake, Lake, do you know where that is? Well, that was, some lakes are in this condition, and they have to come in with uh, harvesters. Um, they have used suction and divers. They put mats on the bottom to, um, to work, there was a beetle uh, that they used to uh, for um, Eurasian water milfoil. But they used it for several years. We did a lot of evaluation on this, but um, we didn't think it would work in our lake because of the um, of the wave action and and then really they have not had. Well, now it's no longer on the market, but um, for. A, in the early eight, uh, in when we first started in 2008, a lot of people were experimenting with, with it. But it it can is very aggressive, um, so that people couldn't get their boats through. Uh, and then this is not Phragmites. This is hybrid cattails, huh. and it's a new invader. Uh, the cattail shell should be like so. They're darker green, they're whiter. Um, we started noticing these a few years ago, and they're very aggressive, and you can't hardly walk through them. Um, we, our ducks and our everything that are in the habitat around the lake are struggling with it. There's, there's a lot of discussion 
because cattails are so good for filtering contaminants before they get to the lake that there are strong feelings that a cattail is a cattail and we shouldn't do anything with them. And there's another field that they are out of control and um, that we should do something. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about it and I want to see some best management practice from somebody who is treating them as yet. I'm, I'm not sure. Do you have thoughts? <laughs> Emily? Um, so the hybrid cattail is a um, variation. There's an invasive species called the narrow leaf cattail and the hybrid is um, basically when you cross the native. And the narrow leaf cattail and it's a relatively new invasive species, all things considered. So there hasn't been a lot of research or management done yet. And we're finding that ourselves. Um, and I know Mary has struggled with this too. We've talked about this at various meetings, but a lot of times when we're doing management, we fall back on what other people have done before, so we don't have to recreate the wheel, but that doesn't exist for this. No, um, so we don't really know what herbicides work, if it's going to kind of keep itself in check, how much it spreads. Um, it's kind of a wait and see. But it's gigantic, and where we had the Pragmites in front of the far center, we now have the, um, the uh, narrow leaf cattails. And perhaps we could do, we talked about being experimental and doing just a certain patch or a certain area of it and see what happens with it. But um, so far, we haven't come to a consensus of it and we, we haven't heard others that have either. Although up, up in the Upper Peninsula, I think they've been we doing some experiments yeah. in there. Okay. So, Invasive species are a threat to our watershed. That's how I got involved with it. Um, the management costs um, are expensive to treat. Um, we've had really good successes, um, better than I think most people have. Um, and so that's why I thought I needed Emily to come and give the uh, invasive picture of what's happening. And after her um, uh, program, then we're going to do Jeopardy. And hopefully you have some fun. You know, I, I thought of how to do this, but we really thought, oh, it's Valentine's Day and maybe this would be fun and we maybe come away with something. So, Were there any questions for Mary before I get started? I should have time. Yes. Uh -huh. well, where do these invasive species come from, and how long have they been here? Well, it varies with the different ones. All of that is out there of when they got here, but a lot of it came from ballast water, is a, a big source of our invasive species. With the spread of Eurasian water milk, well, that is completely, we're doing it ourselves with boats um, that we're taking it from lake to lake from um, not doing uh, clean boats, clean water. Um, the Eurasian water milk flow, I think, came in through the east. Wasn't it out in the east first? Yeah, most are. Y yes, most, they are. Most are on the east coast and move their way yeah. towards us. You can kind of see it, like a wave coming towards the Midwest. Um, and then to help answer Mary's question, I'll be talking <coughs> specifically about how different invasive species travel. Um, to kind of support what you just said. So, <laughs> so, so we're sort of causing our own trouble. Uh, humans are the most invasive species that ever exists on the planet. And we're actually helping these other ones spread around. If, if we weren't here, there wouldn't be no invasive species. <coughs> well, and the biggest stressor to our shores is the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Because they're going to be spreading out studies, national studies of inland lakes, and what is the biggest stressor to it is what we've done along the shoreline with getting rid of our native shorelines and putting up our seawalls and um, our fertilizer and our lawns have, have been a, bit, a real stressor to our miners. All right, so apologies in advance, I'm fighting off a little congestion, so it's nice stuff to cough. 
sorry for that. Um, but again, my name is Emily Cook. I'm the Outreach Specialist for the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. We'll just call it ISN. Um, and our mission statement is up there, and we work with primarily terrestrial invasive plants, so plants found on land, which seems a little contradictory to what Mary's been talking about, everything water, but in fact land plants and some of those transitional species, so the things found on our lake shores and along stream banks play a big role in the watershed and really all things living within the watershed are part of the watershed, so our forests and um, the plants and the wildlife and the streams and creeks and ponds, those are all part of the watershed and, and, and the health of them affects everything downstream and that's why I'm here to talk to you about these invasive species in particular. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do as an organization before jumping into um, the invasive species talk and then I'm going to keep it kind of general at the beginning, what even is an invasive species, how did they get here, why do we care, and then I'll talk about a few species that I think you should know about in regard to um, watershed health in particular and, and those lake shores. Um, so to begin, ISN is a collaborative of over 40 partners in Northwest Michigan. So our service area, if you can see down there in the corner, we cover four counties, Manistee, Benzie, Grand Traverse, and Leelanau. And our home base is in Traverse City, but we cover all four of these counties. We live in the Grand Traverse Conservation District. Um, I live in Arcadia, so I feel like it's appropriate for me to be here in Manistee talking to you. Um, we're entirely grant funded at this point um, through federal and state grants. And these are some of our main partners. So we work with individuals and garden clubs, townships, all the way up to the federal government, um, Sleeping Bear Dunes, the Forest Service, agencies like that. Um, and invasive species is such a huge issue and it has such a wide range that without all of these different partners and the different types of land, private and public, being able to access those land, we wouldn't be able to manage the things that we do. So what we do within ISN, um, we have a program called Go Beyond Duty. It's a program that I actually manage, and it's working with garden club um, nurseries and landscapers, garden clubs, individuals, anyone who's interested in this topic. Um, and what they do is people commit to not selling or using invasive species in their garden projects. Um, we have a top 20 least wanted uh, invasive species in Northwest Michigan. I have a little field book I can, you can look at later. But more than half of those species you can still walk into a nursery and purchase. So this program is trying to educate folks about what those plants are and then prevent them from actually going into a landscape and spreading from there. We do a lot of volunteer work bees, which our main focus is education. Um, getting people actually out in the field, learning how to remove invasive species. Our main projects are garlic mustard. Is anyone familiar with garlic mustard? I'm seeing some uh, heads nodding. It's unfortunately very common. It's everywhere. It's also one of the easier invasive species to manage because you can hand pull it. A lot of the other invasives, like Mary mentioned, you have to use a chemical treatment often, and garlic mustard, you don't have to do that. Um, we also do baby's breath done in Alberta all summer long. Uh, we also do a ton of control, um, so actually going out and treating these invasive species. And they vary. We have our top four, which are listed there, Japanese knotweed, oriental bittersweet, garlic mustard, and then the phragmites. Um, but then we, we treat overall up to 20 or 25 different kinds of species each year. And then we're also focusing on early detection species. We talked about those waves, that wave of invasive species coming from the East Coast, typically from the East Coast. We see them um, in Pennsylvania, New York, um, maybe in Canada, oftentimes Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. And it's pretty, uh, we can predict that they're going to make, be making their way into Michigan. Um, some are in Southern Michigan, but not in Northern Michigan. So our early detection species are ones we're keeping an eye out for. They're not here yet, but we think that they probably will end up here. And if we can get them early, it's a lot easier treating one acre of new Phragmites than an 83 acres once it's too late. Um, if you think about the cost and effort that goes into going after an established population. And then outreach. My job is to talk to whoever will listen about <laughs> invasive species. Um, I talk to four-year-olds and we talk about monarch butterflies, um, which 
everyone understands why we need to care about butterflies, and then we go up to a group like you, and I, I dive in a little more detail. So why do we care about invasive species, especially, ter especially terrestrial invasive species, those land plants in regard to the watershed? Um, and our mantra at ISN is Habitat Matters. We care about the habitat. In fact, that is our website if you want to know more about us. It's habitatmatters.org. And I do have a bunch of materials up here you can grab. You don't have to remember all of this. Um, but there's so much importance to habitat and um, within habitat. And this top one here, it's a little selfish, but we care about habitat because we like to enjoy it. Um, I live in Arcadia because it's beautiful. Well, my husband is from Arcadia, so I live in Arcadia, <laughs> but I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else. It's beautiful. Um, you might notice a, a big wave of tourists come up each summer for a reason, because we have these stunning coastal dunes and this, this lake shore and these really mature forests that everyone loves. And if that habitat is affected, if an invasive species comes in and crowds out all of this diverse native plant life we have, suddenly you just have big stands of Phragmites someplace or a big stand of this other invasive plant, suddenly it's less appealing to come to northern Michigan. Down here, it's a beautiful picture of spring trilliums. Um, could really be anywhere along the coast here, these forests that we have. Um, but this picture actually represents our economy and our forestry industry that we have here. <clears throat> a lot of invasive species crowd out um, tree seedlings. And so if we don't have that regeneration of tree growth every year, we suddenly don't have a forestry economy. Um, and again, going back to our first reason, we don't have these forests that we like to enjoy. <clears throat> and the bigger picture, because I think it's honestly one of the most important ones, is that we care about the wildlife that live in this region. Um, and we have an incredibly diverse <laughs> amount of wildlife, um, from insects to birds to mammals, reptiles. Um, it's, it's amazing to go out in the spring and really see what wakes up each year. And these are just my two poster children for habitat. Um, we care about the birds, everyone knows birds and loves them, but often our insects and our pollinators, I'll throw that word out to you because it's the most important thing, I think, are the pollinators. Um, and these two in particular, I think, stand out more than others. And so, of course, everyone knows our monarch butterflies on the top. Does anyone know, I'm sure everyone knows, what type of plant monarch butterflies need? Milkweed. Milkweed, right. So monarch caterpillars can only eat milkweed. We have five species of milkweed in Northwest Michigan, but they can only eat that, those five plants. And so if you think of an invasive species, species coming into an area and crowding out our native milkweeds, and suddenly they don't have habitat, what's going to happen to our monarchs? Right, they're, they're in trouble, more trouble than they already are from things like pesticide use and things like that, habitat loss. Um, and just for fun, actually I should say they aren't on a milkweed plant in this picture, ironically. Does anyone know what plants that is? I like to quiz people as I go. <laughs> It's a very common um, wetland plant, quite tall, late summer bloom. Joe Pieweed. Joe Pieweed, wow. yes. Yeah. What's it called? Joe, Joe Pieweed. Pie okay. um, and my next question for you is, there's markings on these butterflies, these little spots. These ones have it too. Does anyone know what those little spots mean? Any guesses? Not a hold. It actually tells you that those are male monarch butterflies. Um, and the reason, this, these are both pictures I took actually, and the reason I was able to get these monarch butterfly pictures is because Kingsley Library does a monarch release each year. And they um, arrive very sleepy, kind of cooled down, so kids can actually hold them and take them out to their monarch way station and release them. So these monarchs are tagged. They have a, a program where you can actually put little tiny stickers on their wings, they will migrate to Mexico, and then somebody, hopefully on the other end, will find a monarch with a sticker on it, put it in a database, and the kids can look up to see if their butterfly 
made it to Mexico. And I think last year was the, I forget what year it was, seventh or eighth year maybe that they've done that release. Um, and they had their first butterfly pop up on a database, which was very exciting. Um, and then of course the bottom picture, a little less popular, but I think even more important than our beautiful butterflies, but they get a bad rap sometimes because they can hurt you a little bit. Um, we can hurt them a lot more, are our bees, and this is a bumblebee on a native plant called sneeze, sneezeweed, and this is a picture from Traverse City. I have a question. Yes. Monarch butterfly, how far does it fly, then does it come, I'm guessing it comes back? Actually, it does not come back. So there's a generation that will migrate, and then a new generation, they'll go through the whole life cycle again, and then a new generation will migrate back. So you're not going to get, I mean, I guess there's always the chance that one could come back, and but how often... Many, how many miles is that? Oh, geez. Um, I don't know the miles. Whatever the distance is from here to Mexico, basically. Um, thousands of miles they can fly, definitely. They're an amazing little insect. If you are interested, you can Google monarch migrations or mon monarchs in Mexico, and there are videos of thousands and thousands of monarchs in one place. It's really, really stunning. So those are our most popular ones. The monarchs need milkweed, which is so crucial, but they're not the only species that needs um, one or just a couple of species to live. So these are a couple other examples. We've got our northern spicebush swallowtail, which should look kind of familiar to you as well. Another beautiful butterfly. It's host of the spicebush and sassafras. Um, we have the moth, the double tooth prominent down here. A little less remarkable looking, but still important. It needs elm. Um, and then down here we have a sphinx moth, which is pretty interesting looking on. Uh, they need Virginia creeper. And um, this is a picture from Kids Creek Park, also in Traverse City. And does anyone know what these little white things on this caterpillar are? Hmm? Eggs. Eggs. Well, they're, they're wasp larvae. So I drew this picture up just to kind of show you the, the parasitic relationship between all of these organisms and, and why these habitats are so important. Um, they're all beautiful and wonderful and they pollinate, which we need um, for native plants to thrive. But also, at the end of the day, they're bird food. Um, even monarchs can be bird food. And I put up this picture in particular because it's hard to see, but the mother robin has really meaty, juicy caterpillars in her mouth that she's feeding to her young. Um, and that's really critical to point out because you can feed birds as much as you want, but the baby birds are not going to be at your bird feeders. They're going to be needing those caterpillars and those grubs and the things that are really, really dense with nutrients. Um, a single, there's been some studies done, a single clutch of chickadees, which I think they estimates three or four babies. Um, does anyone want to guess how many insects and caterpillars and things like that they eat in a single day? Fifty. 50? Okay, we have 50. Let's take the two more answers. 300, okay. Anything else? 1,000? Okay, 300 is pretty close. They do almost 400 insects for one clutch per day. Um, so think about, that's just one nest, all right? Think of all the nests, plus every day that they are needing to be fed. How many insects that is, and we need those native plants to support those insects. Um, it's an astounding number. Um, and this kind of really shows you even more. This is from a book called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Talamy. He's a It's a wonderful book if you're interested in this subject more beyond what I'm talking about. But this chart shows um, woody plants. So our, our shrubs and our trees, things like that, and their ability to support just butterflies and moths. And so I'm just going to read the first couple, but this like oak, for example, and that's all oak species, um, white oak, red oak, that sort of thing, um, can support 534 butterflies and moths. Um, and that's just butterflies and moths. Think about all the other insects. Going down, willow, 456, cherry, 456. These numbers are massive, um, and it really shows, I think this chart shows you more than anything why we need the support um, 
these natives. And then on the flip side, we're going to highlight our Phragmites, which you've um, heard about quite a bit already. Here's another picture of Phragmites here. Um, you can ignore the top three. Those aren't plants found in our region. But uh, where it is from, which is Eurasia, it supports about 170 species of herbivores, which is a good number. Right? It's nothing to laugh at. That's a good number of things to support. However, in North America, we found it to support only five species. Um, and it was something introduced accidentally. We don't know for sure how long it's been here. The guess is around 300 years. Um, and at that point, it's been given enough chance to prove to us that it might be able to support something, and it's shown that it can't. Um, and if you go back to uh, these numbers, and then you see five versus almost 500, it's clear um, why we need to manage uh, a lot of these invasive plants, especially the really, really nasty ones like red mites. So what is an invasive species? And I know this seems really simple, but it can get quite confusing sometimes. An invasive species is something that is from a different part of the world. Occasionally you can get a species that is from a different part of like North America. Oregon grape is an example of that. Uh, we don't have a lot of that here. But typically it's from a different part of the world. Here we get a lot from Eurasia and a lot from Asia, Japan area especially. Few natural predators, so there's nothing keeping it in check. Who here gardens at home? What's your number one enemy in your garden? Tomato worms. Tomato worms. How about something bigger that can get a bigger mouthful in your garden? Does anyone have deer in their garden? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. I. There's so many deer. You're in Arcadia. They're everywhere. Um, a lot of times, deer will not even eat invasive species. There have been signs of deer taking bites of garlic mustard and literally spitting it out next to it. Um, whereas we know that they will eat just about everything else. Um, and so there's nothing keeping invasive plants in check, whether that's um, a mammal of some kind or a bug keeping it in check. Uh, and even milkweed have their own little insects keeping them in check, which are the monarchs and some, a few other insects as well. And then just massive seed production. So they have an advantage over native plants because not only do they grow really quickly, but they have a ton of seeds and berries on them. Um, this is an invasive honeysuckle. We do have native honeysuckles as well. Um, but you can see that it's just loaded with berries. And we can blame ourselves for moving a lot of these things, but birds move invasive species. They eat the berries and they drop them. Um, and so, a lot of the time it is our fault, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to drag humans a lot during this presentation, but it's not always our fault. How do they get here? This goes back to the earlier question. And this can really apply to both the land plants and the water plants. Um, they just, their impact varies a little bit and their method of arriving varies. So some, like invasive Phragmites, were imported accidentally, believed to be in, as used as a packing material in ballast, um, and then brought over and dumped, and then from there spread, because they have an incredible um, root system, and these, these are all really big, fluffy seed heads at the top there. Um, they do pretty well. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of things you can still buy, so many things were imported for gardens. Garlic mustard was imported for gardens. Um, one plant I work with a lot is Japanese barberry that was imported. This is a buckthorn, it's uh, a large shrub, a small tree. Um, some are what we call conservation oops. Who's familiar with autumn olive? A lot of hands. Yeah. Especially down here, there's a lot of autumn olive. Um, this, and there are a handful of these plants, but there are some that conservation professionals told people to plant and we're actually giving away autumn olive and selling it and saying you need to plant this for soil erosion and it makes amazing wildlife habitat which it does both of those things but not enough research has been done to also um, show that it spreads like mad and it turns into trees and has millions of berries and it just gets out of control um, so that is a, a problem there 
the people are a lot more careful now, I will say. But unfortunately, some of that damage is done. And then imported for food or medicine, this goes along with gardens. Um, the entire garlic mustard plant is edible, every single part. Um, it was brought over kind of like a salad um, type um, vegetable, I guess you would say, in the mid-19th century. Um, it also is really high in vitamin C. If you find it today, you can make it into pesto. It's not as good as basil pesto, but if you want to use it, it is there to use. <clears throat> and so the next few slides are just a few species I wanted to highlight, um, especially in regard to the watershed and this being a watershed presentation because these impact the waters more directly than maybe some of our other species do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Japanese knotweed um, is often called Michigan bamboo, and you can kind of see from these pictures and down here how it grows. That's why it got it got its nickname. nickname. Um, it's got these really segmented stalks and very very thick stalks. Um, it can grow to be 12 to 15 feet tall. As its name suggests, it was brought over from Japan as a garden plant because it makes a great buffer between you and your neighbor. It absolutely does. Um, unfortunately, Japan has a lot of volcanic activity and this evolves to grow through lava beds. So its roots have no problem growing through the foundation of your home, um, through roadways, sidewalks, um, and then if you think about, okay, that's hurting us, but then those roots being along riverbanks, which it loves to grow on, and going down and degrading that, that shoreline, um, growing 15 feet tall and, and changing the, the sun and shade access to a river, which fish require and insects require different, certain things. Um, this is very harmful in the middle of a field, and it's very harmful on the edge of Portage Lake or along the Manistee River, um, it just impacts things differently. It grows very, very thick. It's also very, very hard to get rid of. Um, a pinky fingernail-sized fragment of this plant can start a new plant. So if you think you have it, don't mow it or hack it down, even though it's so tempting because it's huge and everywhere. Um, this is a plant that we actively manage via our group. So if you have it, you can contact us and. Um, for no or very low cost, we'll come treat it for you. Does that have to be sprayed? It does have to be sprayed, yeah. And often, and, and Mary alluded to this in her presentation, a lot of invasive species have to be sprayed for multiple years for it to actually be killed. So, um, the biggest reference point I have for not weed around here is Veterans Oak Grove Drive. Um, that whole, that whole bank, it was about a mile, I believe, um, was Japanese knotweed, and through some grant funding, we treated that for the first time, 2016, I want to say, it may have been 2017, so I apologize if I'm getting that incorrect, um, and it was a huge, huge project, and the next year, you see it come back, but way less. So usually it's the first year you knock back maybe 70%, and the next year you'll get it down even more. You'll get 70% of that 70%, so it's smaller and smaller each year, until you have the one acre of Phragmites or whatever it is left. So um, these chemical treatments um, are required and unfortunately need to be quite repetitive. Phragmites, I won't talk about too much. This is um, the one that's been getting the most attention, and for a good reason. Um, this is the, the picture that I'm, I'm also using, just because it shows just how huge it can get. Um, and if you've got this on a, a lake shore, how disruptive it can be to that shoreline, not only for the ducks that need habitat to lay eggs, so there's no native plants coming up, Maybe on the edge you can see a few other things growing, but within that, it's way too shady and dense for anything else to grow, so you're not going to have any insect um, activity there. And also, again, looking from a human perspective, if your house is right there and you bought this house so you could have a lake view, um, it's not going to exist with Phragmites there. 
Um, and one thing I did want to point out is in the winter, the, the tops die off and have these dead stalks, and it'll become more green again in the spring and, and, and turn into what we see here. Um, Grand Valley State just did a study um, down around the Grand Rapids area with Phragmites showing that there's actually a major fire hazard with mm -hmm. these dead stalks of Phragmites, which is something we didn't really think about until a couple of years ago, but it's absolutely true. You get rid of the dead stalks of Phragmites by burning them. But if that's not something you're intentionally trying to do and it's an accidental fire, it can be quite scary. Especially if you have 83 acres of burning Phragmites. Another one, purple loose strife. And I wish it wasn't bad because it's really one of the only flowers that has such a bright, beautiful purple color to it. Um, but you can see this monoculture of purple loose strife. And it operates just like the others do. It loves really wet areas, so you're going to find it in wetlands, along riverbanks especially, along, um, I think you had some, Mary, right along Portage Lake. It's really easy to spot when it's blooming. You'll just see uh, this pop of purple, and often, if you can get it with there's just one or two, um, you can cut off the seed head into a plastic bag and tie, you know, and throw it away, and that's the best way to get rid of it. Um, I don't recommend digging this out or cutting it. It's got really extensive roots, um, rhizomes underground that if you cut, it'll start a new plant. Invasive species are invasive for a reason, and they have ways to grow if you try and get rid of them. Um, so uh, many of them are tricky to get rid of. So if you have these, this is why Iacin exists, is to either help you um, treat it yourself or you know come out and treat it for you if we can. Yes? Notice last summer it's starting to get a stronghold on the Big Manistee River from Dippy Dam downstream. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. A little bit still upstream from Dippy Dam, but not as much. Okay. I will check out that, um, that particular location. There's a really good resource, and I didn't put it on this presentation, but it's uh, called the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, um, or MISIN, M-I-S-I-N dot E-D-U. And if you go there, it's actually a database of invasive species in the Midwest, and you can put in practically your street address and zoom in on your neighborhood and see who has reported invasive species, and you can report invasive species. So, um, so that's what I will go to to see if anyone's said that there is purple loose strife, and if there's not, I can put in that information. Um, but if you're curious to see what's out there, there's a lot of information already there. Um, our group has survey technicians, they're college students that go out each summer, and their job is to drive, hike, kayak, and just put in a database all the invasive species they see. The Regional Land Conservancy does the same thing, the Nature Conservancy. So there's a lot of information in this database if you're curious, and that's what we draw our treatment information from as well. So if you find something, you can put it in, um, and it's very beneficial to us. Can you say those letters again? Yes, it's M-I-S-I-N dot E-D-U. It stands for the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, or MISN. And they have the program for your phone. Which yes, it's an app. So yeah. and oh, you, you'll have it right on your phone. So if you're out driving around mm -hmm. and you have your phone mm -hmm. with you, then you can record it right there if you can be sure of it. It's a program through MSU. Um, and also, if you're just wondering what you're looking at, it's, it just has a database of invasive species themselves with pictures and information. So if you're wondering, okay, is this invasive loose strife or is it native loose strife, which we do have, and they look a little alike, so if you're not sure, you can pull out this app and it'll show you um, not only pictures but list characteristics of that plant to help you identify them. And also, if you're really not sure, when we're stuck in the office, we love getting emails and pictures. <laughs> and then I them, so. um, and the last one I want to talk about, um, because I know I'm taking up a lot of time here, is one that is new, um, kind of newly on our radar as an organization. Is anyone familiar with Hemlock Woolly Adelgid? A few folks? So this one is kind of completely different from everything else we do because um, it's an insect, first of all, and we're 
always looking at plants, but we're going after this one hard because it's, a, it's an insect that is getting closer to our region, um, and it's targeting hemlock trees, which are so, so important. They're such a crucial native species. Um, they are one of the most important habitat trees, in my opinion, as far as supporting um, wildlife. And then also, they grow so well on stream and river banks and along lakes. And they're providing the necessary shade that a lot of fish need for habitat. Um, and so, if hemlock woolly adelgid um, starts attacking our hemlock trees, there's very, very little chance of them surviving, and they'll usually die within three to five years, which is quite sad. Um, and what it looks like, um, this is the underside of a hemlock branch, and actually winter is one of the best times to spot it, ironically, when I first heard that we were going to be looking for HWA, or hemlock woolly adelgid, in the winter. I thought they were crazy because snow. How are you going to be able to spot white dots when it's snowing? But it's actually when these pop the best. And also, there's a lot of lookalikes that would only come out in spring and summer, like uh, uh, spider eggs look exactly like that. Other insects, we have the little like spit bugs, that sort of thing. If you see this in the winter, this is probably what you're looking at. Although you can also see old spider eggs and things like that. But um, keep an eye out when you're hiking. If you find it on the tree on your property, what should we do? You call. You would call us. Um, there's some pretty um, set state protocols right now to try and get this quarantined if we do find it. Um, so you call us, we come out and confirm, and we, we actually have to go through a process of, even if we think we found it, like we're, we think it might be spider eggs, but we're not sure, we have to send it in to get double checked and then we'll go from there. But they are on the insides of the needles. These are quite large. That's the insect. It's actually just kind of covered itself in this white material. Um, these are some smaller ones here. It's pretty clear what it is if you can see it, but again, um, this is the time of year to be out looking for it. Oh, and I should point out before I move over it, humans, I'm going to blame us, big part for this. Um, we're one of the main vectors of transportation for hemlock woolly adelgid. And what they're finding is that recreating humans especially, so people with big RVs, um, people out my, mountain biking, hiking, that sort of thing, are picking this up and moving it up the shoreline. And I'll show you a map in a second that really shows this clearly. Um, but also moving firewood. So we've experienced this with ash borer um, and similar insects like that where you have um, quarantines for firewood. Don't move firewood is a big campaign and that falls right in line with this um, adopted issue. So, Hemlock woolly adelgid is in the east, on the east coast. It's been moving this way. We've kind of known it was going to pop up. A couple of years ago, though, we found it in Michigan for the first time. Um, it was found by a group like ISN, but based out of Grand Rapids. And um, this, these are all of the locations, these red dots. Those are all the HWA positive locations. Um, those are the only places in Michigan HWA has been found. And there are efforts throughout the entire state to try and spot this. So we're pretty sure it's contained in this area. But we've got Northern Oceana County. All right, so what is just north of Oceana? <laughs> exactly. So we're very, it's very close to us. And we're aware of that, and we think there's a good chance it could be here, and that's why this big campaign is happening right now. Um, because, because it is right there, it's kind of, there's, it's got to be here. We just need to find it. We need to find it sooner rather than later so we can keep us in check. So those red dots, they're also the vacation of state parks. Exactly. And that goes back to the recreating humans. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these dots, and you'll notice they're all within the lake shore, so they're big uh, state park areas, um, state forest campgrounds, things like that. Um, hemlock is going to be the most dense hemlock stands are usually within five to ten miles of the lakeshore, especially. There's obviously more inland, but the most dense stands are there, so it allows the insect to move more freely. Um, but you're absolutely right that these are a lot of state park boundaries, 
And they've actually found one case where they're almost sure somebody parked under a hemlock tree with their camper. Um, and the adelgid kind of scraped off. And this is totally unknowing on the part of the campers, but it's important to get this education out there. They then moved up the coastline, camped somewhere else, and then you have the movement of that insect. It doesn't move very quickly on its own, but if you have something helping it and driving very fast, up the coastline to its next host tree, then, it, then suddenly you have each of um, And this is a picture of the Appalachian Mountains. And these are all hemlock trees. Um, and this is an area that has really, really been hit. And I'm not, I didn't mean to end my presentation on a super depressing note. <laughs> but I just think it's so important because I think if you're here and you care about the watershed, you're probably outdoors a lot. <coughs> to just be aware of your hemlock trees. And if you think you see something, um, it doesn't hurt to give us a call or call the Manistee Conservation District. Josh Shields um, is a big player in getting this going. Um, uh, or the DNR, everyone is working together on this. Um, and if we can get it taken care of, if we find a tree and we can quarantine it before it spreads any further, then that's wonderful. And in fact, Michigan has been very, very low on taking the first step to do a lot of things environmental um, as far as regulations. Um, but we're actually leading um, the whole country at this point as far as getting ahead of HWA, which is very, very cool. Um, we're actually having people coming to Michigan for a conference to learn about how we basically are going after this swap style. <laughs> Um, which is cool because we don't want this to happen and, and a positive thing I will say is our hemlock doesn't grow quite like it does in the Appalachian Mountains. This is very, very dense. If you're out in the woods you'll see hemlock stand, but then you'll go a ways and you won't see any and then you'll have kind of sporadic populations of hemlock, which is an advantage for us um, because it, the adelgid will not be able to move quite as well. So. Long story short, um, these are the reasons why you should manage invasive species, even the ones inland that might not seem to direct, directly relate to your lakes and streams and, and the precious water resources. But in my opinion, they're just as important um, as some of the, the ones that are right in our lakes and streams. Are there any questions? Yes. What should you do if you have autumn olive? So autumn olive, um, are they big or small? Big. They're big. Um, so autumn olive can be treated the less, and I don't want to say less work intensive because it's kind of a mixture. What we recommend for large autumn olives is cutting them off at the base. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. And then. Um, just dabbing the stump right after you cut it with an herbicide and a simple herbicide like Roundup will do this. And Wait, isn't that dangerous? Like cancer producing? If used incorrectly, and I am not a chemical advocate, I will say that here. You can use other ones, um, but the, the, the thing with Roundup is it's not as bad as some of the other chemicals out there. Um, and if you're just literally taking a paintbrush and painting the stump and using the appropriate protocol to cover yourself um, and you're just putting it on the stump so you're not harming any other plants, that in the fall especially, when the, the plant is trying to suck down as many nutrients, it's also going to be sucking down that chemical and it will kill the plant from basically the roots. It is, so is the fall the best time? The fall is the best time and you can actually do it in the winter too. Um, fall and winter because basically if you think about the science of how plants grow, in the spring they're trying to put all of their energy up. Yeah. Um, in the fall they're trying to be dormant for winter and get all the resources down. So if you cut an autumn olive and then paint that stump with a chemical, they're going to be pulling, doing the work basically for you to pull that chemical down into its roots. It won't know the difference between that and... So if I do it in the winter, like winter before it becomes spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what a lot of people don't. <laughs> yeah, there's actually a handful of those um, woody invasives that you can treat throughout the winter. Um, 
this time of year, you're probably safe. I always, I'm hesitant to say too close to spring. I mean, you can do it year round. You're just going to have better luck when you know the plants kind of working towards becoming that, dor going into that dormant phase. Okay. Um, too late in the spring, you might not have as much luck. Okay. Or late in the winter, edging on the spring, I mean. Okay. Oh. Were there any other questions? Yes. Are there any invasive invasive species that are a direct threat to us? I mean, they're like our her human to house. Our, not just uh, causing trouble and stuff like most of these, but actually a threat to our own survival. Um, that's a really good question, and it's kind of a deep question. I think that they can contribute to our own survival in the sense that they can severely diminish the pollinator population, which in, in turn can diminish our food, um, like how much food is growing. Um, I think, I don't remember the exact numbers, but the amount of pollinators that have died off that would normally contribute to our corn and wheat and everything else that grows, um, it's a, it's a shocking number. And then that definitely could affect us. And if you prefer meat, then we still need those things to feed the animals that feed us. It's kind of this, this circle um, of things. There's nothing that's going to directly affect our survival immediately, but gradually, I think, definitely. There's also a few plants that really hurt. Um, has anyone heard of giant hogweed? Yes. Causes really terrible burns. If you got trapped in a stand of hogweed, you might die. I mean, there, there are plants like that. There's none around. They, they aren't around here, fortunately. Um, but there are plants that actually can be quite terrifying in that regard. I try and leave them out, especially um, to try and keep the, the mood a little light. But <laughs> Sort of okay. camping where the kudzu is, and obviously the next morning you're covered with the plant. Okay. <laughs> right. We're going to play some Jeopardy now. Getting eaten by the <laughs> We're going to play a quick game of Jeopardy. I'll move we over certainly here. won't go through all of the uh, questions and that. And we're going to have um, our leader here. I was in one of the pictures. She was in one of the pictures. Yeah, she's the picture. she's a right. star. <laughs> a star. Okay. Linda, can you be one of the leaders? Um, you're going to pick the question amount and pick the category and the amount. And okay. Susan Macarelli, can you be the other one? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you pick the category okay. and you pick the um, question amount. Go ahead, right? Susan. Do I get to answer the question or can No, okay. Then everybody in the audience can shout out the answer. Okay. Or, well, no, I'm going to give you the answer and you're going to give me the question. And that's how you play WJ, an acronym for Watershed Jeopardy. We love acronyms, don't we? Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's go first. Go ahead, Susan. Susan. Okay, watershed for 100. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, 65% of this type of land has been destroyed in the last 50 years. What are wetlands? Linda. All right. Invasive species, 100. Oh, come on. Go for the higher amounts. Okay. Someone back here said it. Yeah, Who said it? it? Fred Babies. Yeah. Okay. Another Woo! sucker. Can you please pass this up? All right. Every minute. Susan. Okay. Thank so you. Water shed for 200. 200. Isn't this cool? The music and everything. What are water quality tests? I don't know what you're looking at here. What do you measure with a sechi disc? What do you measure with a with a trim? What do you water chemistry? I don't know. The answer is it's the trophic state oh, index. Trophic. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, ye
So who's, did you think I'm going to say uh, non-point source pollution 500? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, some of these I'm not sure are under the right category. <laughs> Read your question. But we'll see what you get here. <laughs> oh, see, I haven't even entered it here. Well, oh. I can have a one, Linda. We can have a one. All right, uh, non-point source 400. What did you pick? 9.6, 400? Well, let's see. Oh, oh, we didn't get it. What does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Oh, it means she didn't put it on. I didn't put it on. Give me general knowledge, 500. You might have to go with the 100. Yeah, 500. No, I have a, but it just didn't have it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the natural shoreline. Oh, sucker. Who gets the sucker? Uh-oh. Over there. Over there. All right. Would you do a sucker? <laughs> All right. Susan. Oh, boy. Okay. Another sucker for the lady. No. No. <laughs> No, no, we aren't giving these out for nothing. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Linda? Give it to her. Um, yeah, send it to her. Invasive species 500. Oh. The township band. Who would know the township band? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Where did you get these? <laughs> they're good questions. Oh, they're good. Okay. Okay. Yes, it'll take. Okay. It. And that's what you, that's what allows you to have a special assessment. Public Act 188. Okay. Did, did you get it? Yeah. yeah. She got it. Sucker. 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 All right. Susan. Somebody asked the Portage Lake one here, Linda. Get us on Portage Lake. Portage Lake 100. Yeah. There you go. What is the what is the Portage Lake Watershed Association? No, I mean it's a plan. Oh. It's <laughs> soccer for her. No. No, 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 I didn't get it right. That was a plan. It's it's probably close to land. I think that is well, I got a soccer. That's what a group of fifty people got together and developed the watershed plan. So that's great. All right, Linda. Okay, general knowledge 300. Besides from I don't know. What is it? Yeah. What is it? Storm drains. Storm drains. Storm drains go directly into the... Can we get a second to this? Mm -hmm. Oh, give him a second. Oh, give him a second. Oh, give him a second. He also sits, so he gets a second. That's why the three can be in here. Susan. What's the... There we go. Linda gets a uh, sucker. It, it's, and our Portage Lake watershed is not all in Onekaba uh, Township. It's also a little bit in Bear, a little bit in Manistee, and a little bit in Brown. Susan. Oh, you just did it, Linda. Okay. I just did it. No. Oh, okay. Um, invasive species 400. What are invasive species? Well, 
these are the ones that um, yeah, she said about the hemlock that's coming. They're on the. Oh, 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 Japanese still grass, they're, they're not here yet, but they're... I, I do want to point out that New Zealand mud snail has been identified here. Not here in Manna State, but in Grand Traverse County. And there is one population of kudzu on Crystal Lake. Oh, yes, sir. I was planted outside of kudzu cottage. Somebody brought it and planted it. Is European a dog bite animal or vegetable? It's it, a vegetation. It's, it's a vegetation, uh, aquatic plant. Uh, <laughs> is, is there a wonderful story behind its name? <laughs> yeah. <I don't> know. <laughs> Somebody brought it to plant at the, the, their cottage, which was called Kudzu Cottage. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Does it survive? No. Well, it's surviving, but not doing well because of our winters. We did. Okay, so Susan, you're next. All right, wait. Here you go. Oh, well. Pick one. Not source pollution from about the timeline for Honeycat today. My pal? Patricia pled guilty to second degree. The new man by oh. It's your choice of two friends on the weakness. Two for five dollars is best deal. Sue Brown just One thing about this cat, you will not look at her you want to. Sensitive skin. We switched to time. No one is going to all the people. It's gentle on her skin. And now cleans the other food. Kind of full moon air. Saturday night. Today is January 19th. It's a Saturday night. Tomorrow night it is the uh, eclipse. Nine o'clock. It's way off.
happened? Well, it's a little later. I was waiting for the sun to go down a little bit. The moon is up a little bit more. Really impressive. And I'll be back out here tomorrow night. Well, midnight, we're going to have an eclipse. Well, there is the uh, moon. The eclipse has started. <laughs> Good evening. This is Mike Tillis, and this Martin Luther King Day, January 21. 2019. Still have a full moon. We will have another full moon or another day or so. The, uh, I got some moon last night, but when it was the eclipse, it was all cloudy, so I didn't get it. The best way I found a video of the moon is just a camera on a mic monopod, that'd be mono one pod, one leg, walking stick, whatever you want to call it. Works quite well. Again, you can see as always, right about uh, one o'clock is the harp seal big black eyes, nose, and right below him is the uh, two faces, one face is at this position he's looking down a little bit, absolute profile, lots of hair, like Elvis, and then the other look is when I gotta wait till it goes back because I can't see him always by both at once. Your eyes and brain played tricks on you when you're looking at something like the moon. There it is. Okay. This is the profile one that he's looking down. And then the other <laughs> On the other one here is a couple big uh, black sunglasses. Just want you to see that. A lot of people can't see it on photograph even on a point it out to him unless I draw it out for him. Today's uh, January 31, third snow day this week. A lot of activity going on at the town. Well, here is Bubby. Groundhog's Day, he looked for a shadow. He found his shadow, you can see us in the thing, but he's been tripped. Hence, Bill. You spent a lot of time in Latin America. Where does this head with the military? We saw a Bobby is looking for his shadow. The first major military defection, the attache here in Washington also defected. Do we get to a situation Yeah, we turn off the lights and no more shadow. Turning on the Venezuelan people. Well, jail time. 
It's taken a lot of time. It's taken up a lot of time for our yeah, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon to be targeting these good drones. But we still look there is another side of the indication of bright and sun. Just to give you an example of how seriously so Buck B and realizes now Uber to our live location. Cat brain at this. So yesterday she dropped some six of the six 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 more weeks away. drone in plain sight. Well a couple of oh, man, he doesn't know six weeks is who actually owns the car. Okay, Bobby I'll tell you a month and a half. The I agent asked Man, okay. what he knew about the drone. Leland? Well, it's uh two PM on Groundhog's Day. Honey cat, a domestic long hair, <coughs> has been looking for her shadow. Can I find it? She's probably going to take a bath and then take a nap. about Even for a cat, honey cat is not very bright. Well, good afternoon. It's February 4. Temperature is about 40. We've lost most of our snow. A week ago, we were in the middle of a polar vortex. That didn't last long. Well, good evening. It's uh, Sunday night about 6 o'clock. I'm on division for the uh, World Famous Bed Race.
I don't think there's a... for the 
Family Children's Assessment Center, the Heffron Farms team. Give it up for Lady Liberty and the Four Knuckleheads. And back again to defend their bed of race title from 2017. Racing to benefit Manistee Catholic Central's athletic department and the Manistee High School wrestling team. Make some noise for your defending bed race champions, the post office. the introductory parade. Our first heat will start from down there. Makes sense to me. Now if you guys want a little snack or if you find yourself thirsty, even though the cool breeze does feel nice. All right. 